Hey troglodytes, so today we're going to be taking a look at Bricklink Studio 2, more specifically its photorealistic CGI rendering option, and we're going to see how it works. Let's go. So basically what you're supposed to render with this software are your Lego builds, right? <laughs> you have something you physically built in real life, you want to bring it to the software to then share with other people, or something you're building in the software that you might physically want to build in real life with real Legos and real colors and real materials. It is very clear that the creators of the software truly understand the material properties of Lego. They understand all the different roughnesses, all the different reflectivities, all the different transparencies, all the different translucencies, how they get scratched, how they get damaged by UV light, and then just how all these things fit together in such a glorious way. You know, all the materials are so beautifully realized when you throw them into the CGI renderer that you can create some truly spectacular results. So after, you know, playing with these materials a little bit and kind of creating all these goofy little renders and builds and stuff, I want to see how do all these materials behave individually. So the first thing I want to take a look at is how are scratches applied to the bricks? Because you've probably seen before in some of these previous images I've been showing that, you know, some of the bricks are a little scratched up. They're, they look like they've been used. They look like they've been, you know, thrown around, tumbled together in some huge container, and they've all, you know, been dinged up a little bit to kind of make them look even more realistic. Like, you know, this is actually a real thing. That's what we're going to take a look at here. So this is the control. This is with 0% scratches, right? No scratches, no nothing. It's just pristine. This is with 25% scratches. This is probably what most bricks would actually end up looking like. So here's with... 50% scratches. It's probably towards like the absolute upper end of what most people's, you know, Legos would actually look like. But you can go further. Go to 75% scratches. <laughs> and this looks like somebody took some steel wool and just started really scrubbing the bricks down, you know, to get them all nice and clean. And if you're really a masochist, you can go to 100% scratches. Which is just much, like all the scratches look like they're much deeper, they're much, um, they're much worse, you know? You know, if you really zoom in in these scratches, you know, are they changing the geometry of the bricks or are they just applying some texture over top of them? And I'm pretty sure it's just like a normal map or just some like basic texture they're applying. Because when you really crank on in, you can, you can kind of start to see that they're low resolution. Although, um, can we, can we enhance this please? Can we, um, enhance, enhance. Ah, oh, there we go, that's perfect. Yeah, so you can really see these are just, you know, just a chunky image that's kind of applying over everything. But, when you look at it in a normal distance, it looks pretty good. So above the scratches option is the UV degradation option. And I was wondering, what does that do? How does that damage the bricks? Does it make them look yellow? I don't know. Let's find out together! So I have a sample of different materials here to see how the UV degradation option affects them and the only one that really seems to be affected is the glow-in-the-dark brick the kind of the third one up here and it's really very subtle you know going from zero to a hundred it's, it's pretty minor so that's that's not going to make that big of a difference now you know so the next thing I want to examine is the reflective qualities of these bricks. Alright, so as you would expect, rubber isn't reflective at all. It's almost perfectly diffuse, which is very useful for um, when you're setting up scenes and you don't want any reflections on something. You can make it out of a nice rubber material like this. You know, plastic behaves as you would expect. It's slightly reflective, but you know, fairly diffuse still. You can see some very faded reflections on the left and right, and the silhouettes on the bottom and the back. And that's really about it for this material. Now next is the chrome silver material, the most reflective material by far. You can see the front side of him, you can see the back side of him, you can see the back of his head, you can see so many different reflections. You can see reflections in reflections. Ah, oh, it's brilliant, I love this material. Next up is the pearl flat silver, and you can see the back of his head fairly clearly. It's a lot more dull, it's a little bit more grayed out. You can see some pretty clear reflections on the left and right and on the bottom. The next is the pearl white material. It's kind of like rubber, but it glows. Not reflective at all, entirely diffuse, very interesting. Next is the metallic silver material. It's kind of like a fairly diffuse metal. You can see very diffuse reflections from all angles here. 
you know, the, the fall off is very interesting. They're very, you know, they get a little bit sharper the closer they are to the minifigure. But as they get further away, they get extremely diffuse, which is what you'd expect. And finally is a really fun material. This is the speckle dark blue gray silver. There's all these cool silver speckles in it. And you can kind of see some very diffuse reflections in it, but it's just it's kind of fun. You know, why not, right? If you want to sparkle up your build with a little bit of pizzazz, you can lock this bad boy in there. So now that we know what reflections look like on perfectly opaque materials, what did they look like on transparent materials? All right, so up first is your basic glass window. You can clearly see the minifigure behind the window holding his nice pink guitar there. You can kind of see some reflections on the window, and you can see the reflections of the minifigure inside the box fairly clearly. And then of course, when you put a nuke behind him, you can see it very clearly. Up next to the transparent clear material, you can see that there are very strong reflections on the glass, which obscures the minifigure a little bit, but you can still see him. And the diffuse reflections on the walls of the box, as well as the reflection below the minifigure. And when you put a nuke, Behind him, you can see the minifigure perfectly clearly, you can see his reflection perfectly clearly, and you can see some internal reflections in the glass. Alright, so up next is the glitter transparent clear. It is basically the same as the regular transparent clear material, except it has glitter, which makes it slightly harder to see through. But other than that, it shares all the same properties as regular transparent clear. So up next is glow in the dark transparent and when it's lit normally it's pretty much entirely opaque you can barely see the outline of the minifigure and when you put a nuke behind it you can see the outline of the minifigure slightly more clearly you can just barely see an extremely diffuse reflection and that's about it this is the transparent rubber <laughs> um it is not transparent which is extremely opaque and even when you put a nuke behind it, you can't really see anything. It's just kind of lit up, which is very interesting. So next up is the satin transparent clear. It's kind of like if you took the glitter transparent clear, but you made it extremely opaque. You can just barely see the reflection on the glass. And if you put a nuke behind it, you can see the minifigure fairly clearly. You can kind of see his reflection. That's about it, really. All right, so now you understand the materials. You understand how they interact. You understand how they work. And then you built your model and you're ready to render it. And you realize, oh my gosh, this is gonna take forever with this sample count. Can I lower the sample count? How low can I go? That's what we're about to find out now. 128, don't go below 128 samples unless your scene is extremely brightly lit. So the default options of 512, 256, and 128 are probably all you're ever gonna need. And the darker your scene is, the more sample count will start to matter because it'll reduce this horrible grain. And as you can see, if, as we start going below 64 samples, it just turns into a mess. So, I mean, that's just pure, purely academic, basically. Maybe you can get away with 64 samples if it's extremely bright, but I would say a minimum of 128 is gonna be good enough. All right, so rendering out a 540 by 540, 10 second long, 30 frames per second test render, or 300 frames total. Rendering it at a full 512 samples, took about an hour and 32 minutes. Cutting the sample count in half down to 256 samples, saved about 48% render time, down to about 48 minutes. And then cutting it in half again down to 128 samples, saved about another 43% render time compared to 256 down to 27 minutes and then dropping down to 64 samples having it again saves another 40% down to about 16 minutes and 15 seconds then anything below 64 samples the time gains are pretty much negligible so again, you save 33%, down to 20%, down to 11%, down to 5%, down to 4%, down to 3%. Eventually, the bulk of the render time is just denoising. The actual like time rendering the frame is negligible. So, and, and the quality is so terrible that going down below 64 samples is not worth it. So dropping down from 512 samples down to 128 samples, you save about 71% render time. Or if you were to drop down from 512 samples down to 64 samples, you save about 82%. So is that extra 11% worth it? 
I don't know if you want to do something really quick, it's probably okay, but if you want to do something that's actually of any degree of quality, then it's probably not worth it. All right, so now that you've gotten the basic shakedown and how the most important rendering settings work, on how all the materials behave and that kind of stuff, you can start to put them together to create these beautiful composite images using the transparency feature. So it will render out a nice, beautiful, transparent background. And you can create glorious stuff like this, like my bathroom in the sky, this glorious, serene, peaceful environment where you're just floating above the world. You know, it's just this glorious, peaceful, serene thing. This is probably one of my favorite images I've ever made. You know, I really like that film grainy look of the unfiltered image, so I added some film grain back into it, and I created my favorite image I've ever produced. But you can let your imagination run wild. You, you say you want to be on this floating rock in the sky, you can render that too. Or if you want to be in the sky kitchen where the sky chefs make the sky food for the sky planes, you know, for the airplanes, you can, you can create that too. You can create whatever your heart desires. It's, the options are truly limitless. But there are still unsolved mysteries about this renderer. Like if we zoom in here, what is this strange reflection through the windows? That's not part of the image. Where is this reflection coming from? Or on this image, where is this reflection coming from? Or here, where is this reflection coming from? Oh my god. There's something out there, isn't there? So this is when I decided to launch my investigation. I took a base plate of size 50 by 50 made it out of a chrome silver material, and faced the camera straight down on the smooth side. I then rendered out each of the five different lighting options, and here are the results. Yeah, so first we have the building option, which is just some lights at a different angle. Not that interesting. Then we have the mechanic option, which is different lights at different angles. Then we found something. We switched to asteroid. And it was this weird picture of this square or something with these buildings. Like, what is this? The mystery was solved when we switched to Dawn. And we saw it was this picture of these hangars or warehouses or something. And finally, out of curiosity, I switched it to the final option of Piazza, which was the same picture as Asteroid, but like from a slightly different angle. What, what, what is this? Why are these images here? Well, this crazy mystery is probably pretty simple. You know, they probably put these images in there because when you apply the light from them onto certain scenes, it makes it look more like a realistic environment, like they're actually in some real world place. You know, instead of it just having flat white lighting or flat whatever lighting, there's a little bit of color to it. Why they chose these specific images for that, I have no idea. But it's probably just to add some more interesting lighting to your scene if it's just an outdoor basic shot. So anyway, that's basically it for this video. That's all I wanted to cover. Okay, bye!